Oh, Dave, it's after lunchtime, and this is the time when many people fall asleep. Dave, Dave, we're on. We're on, Dave. <laughs> Buenas tardes. Estamos muy contentos de tener este, esta oportunidad para hablar con ustedes hoy. And that's the end of my Spanish. Thank you. <laughs> Gracias. Gracias. We are um, so delighted to be here. Um, every time we get involved with one of the PTI programs, we feel inspired. Uh, Monica and Jeff have done this amazing thing where they've, they've brought so much to so many people around the world. It's just energizing and amazing. And the guitar music this morning was just fabulous. I'm an amateur musician myself, and I was astounded. It was so lovely. So, oops. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to work this thing on my own here. There you go. Okay. Um, we're also honored to be in the company of this distinguished keynoters. Uh, we really, you have some really fabulous people with a worldview that is just so big and so valuable. Um, now, we want to warn you a little bit. Uh, TheraPlay is a bit different from the point of view of, that's been represented already at the program today. Um, it, because it's therapist directed, it may not seem so child oriented, but it really is very much child oriented. It's just in a different way. And the principles and the goals are the same as the other approaches that you've seen already. So uh, please keep your mind open a little bit. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more later and see if you can um, work around this, this uh, other approach. Mm -hmm. How do, I'm going to read the PowerPoint and then talk a little bit about each one. Oh, we should say that. And we are doing that because um, we have the English PowerPoint that is connected with our videos. And we could not send the videos ahead because of patient confidentiality. Um, but Joaquin um, did a wonderful job of translating for you. Um, so I am going to read the slide, and David is also. Um, and then we will speak. Yeah, no good Okay. okay. Um, so how do you reach the positive inner sense of self and hopes for relatedness that are the heart of attachment theory? We were hearing about that this morning. Um, Dr. Mario you know, gave a wonderful overview, I think, of what is it that is the essence and heart of children who have a secure relationship with a parent. Um, a primary caregiver. And remember, we're talking about the relationship here, the relationship as primary. Uh, attachment theory and decades of research have shown us the critical nature of interactive experience with caregivers in the first two years of life. Many decades ago, when I was a college student, the big topic in developmental psychology was whether people became who they are because of nature or genetics or by nurture. Uh, now, since then, we have a lot of neurobiological research to show that there's a profound interaction between the two. It's not simply one or the other. Um, as um, our, our two previous keynoters have mentioned this morning, uh, experience is what opens the door to genetic potential. The self and personality develop out of early parent-child interaction. We know that now. And when we look at attuned interactions, and by attuned, we're talking about awareness. We're talking about connectedness. We're talking about a synchrony and timing of relationships. And these result in the child's inner representation of three different areas. We're looking at the self, the child's view of himself or herself. But we're also looking at the child's then view of other people that has become internalized. That other people are positive 
are loving or responsive. These are, this is the positive goals or the positive outcome. And that in fact the self, back to the first one, is lovable. I am someone who's lovable. I am special. And I am competent. I can do things and operate on my environment. And then expanding that circle beyond the self and the other is my sense of the world. What is the world like? And when I have had some positive inner experiences that I've been able to internalize, then I see the world as a safe place. I see the world as an exciting place. And as Mario was talking about this morning, that some of these categories don't always fit. You know, we're talking about how do we categorize? How do we, sometimes they're more extreme or that there's overlap between the different categories so that it may not be all perfect as we know, as we know with ourselves and our relationships and with our families. Okay. David will tell you about what happens perhaps on the other side. Um, and I would also add, as Professor Brown uh, said this morning, uh, also having an, an image of what the relationship might be like. I, I really appreciated that addition. I think that was really helpful. So if the early experiences uh, with a child and caregiver, mother, we, we assume usually, um, isn't so attuned, um, I suppose I should read the cards. So misattuned interactions result in a child's inner representation of herself or himself as unlovable or incompetent. Uh, others as uncaring or untrustworthy, and the world as not such a safe place or full of threats. So you saw in the images um, this morning of the Romanian children uh, who were uh, reared initially all by themselves as being all in their own world. Some people would have called in the past an autistic kind of uh, presentation of being only in their own world. So this the... Um, when a child does not have these attuned interactions, and it does not have to be perfect, it's just a good enough environment, as Winnicott would have said. Um, when the child has uh, enough satisfying experiences to think of herself or himself as trustworthy and lovable, then the attitude toward the world is open. And, and those, otherwise, the children who don't have those experiences are more likely to do negative things in the world or to be less connected with the world to help make it a better place in general. So as David is, has been alluding and telling you, um, an attuned relationship between a child and mother or other caregiver, other important primary caregiver, maybe the therapist, you know, um, opens the door to expressing the child's genetic and human potential. So we're looking at the interaction. We're looking at those opportunities for experience that tends to be in the here and now that the child can integrate, that the child can take in at a level that is meaningful for him. But we have to provide an opportunity for that. It was when, as, as Dr. Frazier was talking about, it was when those children were set free that they then could start their development. And perhaps one of the things that struck David and I was that there were trustworthy people around to do that with. Okay. And we'll talk about, as we move on, the elements of TheraPlay that we feel are critically important to help start that process going. Okay. So when things don't go right, it's not fair that I have to do the downside here, and Sue gets <laughs> to do the upside. Um, but when things don't go right, um, a child may not be able to reach his or her potential and may not develop resources to enjoy life and to contribute to society. So uh, among the things that could go wrong, for example, what interrupts an attuned interaction between a parent and child? So it could be, for example, the, the parent is an alcoholic, 
or and is not always present with the child. It could be, or a drug addict for that matter. Uh, it could be that the child has a medical condition uh, which causes great pain and the child can't really perceive or accept the, um, the kindness or love that the parent is giving. There, there are many social um, things which you could interrupt it. All those things might make it hard. The, uh, we needn't uh, you know, say more about uh, the difficulties in the world. Um, we, you saw a, uh, a video of Tronic this morning. I don't know, did we do it? Okay, we're going to do this. Um, uh, this is the same experiment, but what I want you to do is to pretend for a moment that we have a time machine and you're going to see Ed Tronic about 20 years ago, 30, 30 years ago. Um, about 20 years ago, uh, he steered us to this particular video, which we really find helpful. It adds one little bit to the one you saw, and I think you'll like it, um, because it, it, the one little bit really talks to this piece that we haven't addressed very much so far, which is how um, attuned caregiving um, makes for uh, better self-regulation. And self-regulation is critical to being able to manage your feelings, to manage, uh, to manage your behavior, how you interact with other people, to maintain yourself at work. So self-regulation is critical. So we're going to do that and, and show you this real quickly. Um, uh, do I need to do this sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touches. So they can. One of the infant's first jobs is to develop a way of handling all these new experiences. <laughs> Professor Edward Schleinick of the University of Massachusetts began his work in the early 1970s. The emphasis in child psychology then was on how children learn. But his early studies suggested a dramatic new direction. When I first started working on it, I was um, working in an infant daycare center, and I felt like yeah, she wants to talk about that. Okay. Go ahead, Cynthia. I know. I was looking at some of your faces, and I feel yeah. sad every time I see that. When I see this little one just reacting. We saw the child this morning, a little older, who was able to protest in a different way. Ah, screech. You know, this one, you know, his whole body became more dysregulated, and he started to lose bodily fluid, as they said. But notice, what I want you to notice is that there was a dance, a kind of co-regulating dance that happened at first when they were playing. And it's this expectation that mom is going to react in a consistent way that I understand as a little one. Okay. And the child learned his own ways of coping already. He looked away, away, he held his hands and he looked at his hands, all ways to kind of try to calm himself a little bit. And knowing that he could smile for mama and that she would come back in, okay? And Tronic mentions that the pattern of disengagement is seen when parents are depressed, long-term depression, because these children don't have the opportunity for the repair. And that's the important piece, is the repair of the relationship. Okay? Yeah, there you go. I got to stay there. Okay. I asked you to stay a little less close to the mic, because she, her, <laughs> she wasn't popping. Okay, so uh, this slide says, for society there are significant costs since people with poor attachments to others often show little concern for other people and often struggle more to contribute to society. Now I'm going to give the only political message that I'm going to give here. We in America have a president. Um, his name, uh, he shall go nameless, uh, uh, who doesn't get it and doesn't have the empathy in order, and undoubtedly had this kind of experiences. And it isn't really funny, it's tragic. So, hey, now I just want to tell you about a fun little experiment. Um, there was a very fun experiment, um, uh, which is not very well known. 
many, many years ago, 15, 20 years ago, in Philadelphia in the in, uh, United States. They had um, uh, first-time mothers um, who were poor, and they, they were aged um, from about 18 to about 40, but they never had a baby before. And they did one single therapeutic intervention with these, these uh, uh, mothers. They gave half of them a front pack carrier, like you saw yesterday with um, uh, the folks that did that wonderful uh, elephant imagination thing. A uh, front pack carrier to take home the baby. The other group, they gave one of those little cradles that you carry around like a shopping bag. And they had pedometers sewn in the bottom so they knew that they were being used. And then they checked these children for the security of their attachments at four months and 11 months. And the children who went home with the front pack carriers, of those children, uh, 66 or, or so percent of them were securely attached with their mothers. The ones who went home with the cradles, about a third of the parents, about 33 percent. That single little intervention for 60 bucks, six, I don't know how many euros, but uh, not very much money because the front pack carriers brought the child close to the mother and was able, there was physical contact and more engagement. And the mothers also said they felt closer to their babies and were more engaged with them. That simple bit, the help attachment, is just amazing in terms of what. So the things we can do as play therapists can go way beyond that. <clears throat> this one says, as play therapists, <laughs> Our challenge is how to connect with children and families in a way that makes a profound and essential difference. At a time when I was in my training, behavior modification was popular. And although I felt it was helpful, I felt that there were many, many children that I just really wasn't reaching at a deeper level. And I started seeking elsewhere, seeking more, trying to figure out as a, as a play therapist, as a, as a therapist in general, how could I connect? And I was also working with children who had developmental disabilities. Many of the traditional techniques that were re relied on verbal skills, many of my students and my clients didn't have that emotionally and socially, developmentally. They were much younger. So I needed to find other ways of how I could connect in a meaningful way with them. Okay. Uh, when we started out as play therapists, uh, we found that many children and young teens came to us with concerns such as low self-esteem, overactive behavior, anxiety, aggressive behavior, and depression. So how to get at those things? And the TheraPlay approach can address all of those different kinds of things. Um, it often was hard to reach those children to get at the deeper issues of valuing themselves and valuing other people. That's the hard thing. As therapists, almost everybody here struggles with how to help the self-esteem of our clients. Anybody agree with that? <laughs> Do you struggle to help your uh, clients feel good about themselves? Mm -hmm. okay. um, or as some would say it, to be able to love themselves and love others. Um, it was hard sometimes to make a connection in a meaningful way with some children and teens. We saw in the uh, movies about the Romanian uh, children this morning how a playful uh, therapist could engage children just through the playful interaction. A lot of it was mostly probably nonverbal. Uh, I mentioned... Yeah. When, um, when I started studying and working with children with autism, many of them didn't have even the very basic relationship skills, and that's part of the definition of autism. And so I really started to look at what's happening to me nonverbally, what can I do nonverbally, what can I do in short verbal interactions to help make a connection with this child. Okay. Uh, for us, it had a personal impact. Uh, we were just starting to raise our two children around the time that we were learning how to do therapy. And I think it was very important. Um, Sue was completing her PhD, which took nine years, by the way, while we had our two children. Um, 
I, I came to realize that part of becoming myself was differentiating from my family of origin and wanting to parent in my own way. And as I tell the young men that I see, because I see older uh, kids and adults as well, one of the jobs of any young man or young woman is to differentiate from your family of origin and decide who you want to be and what kind of person you want to be, to take the parts of your dad, if you're a guy, that you like and let, let go of the parts that you didn't like so much uh, when you were a boy. Uh, in later years, um, I think it was uh, Dr. Brown who mentioned this morning, uh, Dan Siegel has talked about each therapist having a coherent sense of himself or herself. So having a coherent sense of, pardon me? Uh, yeah, well, Mario also. Oh, Mario also. Uh, uh, this um, so um, the, the importance of that um, is that when you're clear on who you are and from whence you spring, then your own issues don't color the interactions you have with the, the clients that you work with, or your own children in our case. So. Mm -hmm. so as we were learning about TheraPlay, I want to tell you, give you a definition of TheraPlay now. TheraPlay is a form of play therapy based on attachment theory and congruent with neurobiological research. TheraPlay addresses the pre-verbal development of the sense of self and others as well. It was first developed in the 1960s by the American psychologist Anne Jernberg, whose focus was on the healthy parent-infant relationship and parent-child relationship. At present, TheraPlay is used in 30 countries, over 30 countries around the world. So with a sensitive attunement to the child's needs, TheraPlay is physical, it's therapist directed, and it's fun. So you'll learn a lot more about that. And for those of you who worry about such things, it's now considered evidence-based. <laughs> oh boy. Um, um, as we began to uh, learn about therapy, TheraPlay, we found ways to connect with the inner sense of self and hopes for relatedness that are at the heart of attachment theory and at the center of fully being human. Okay. So, we're going to do a little exercise right now. Think for a minute what happens in healthy interactions between children and their parents. What do you notice when you see people you admire interacting with their children in a positive way? So think for a minute. Maybe it applies to you as a parent. Or maybe you remember when you were young and someone parented you in a way that you felt positive, you felt good. What, what might that look like in our picture or our video of healthy parents and children when you admire? You know? So I'll take a think, think, think for a minute and I'll take some suggestions of things that you might see happening. Laughing. 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 I love that. Laughing. Over here? What else? Looking at each other. Looking at each other. Eye contact. Laughing. Looking. Yes. Relaxed. Relaxed. There's a comfort. Relaxed. Between the two of them. An easiness. Yeah. 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 Oh, there's a confidence between them. Yeah. This is, this is good. This is a fun thing. Uh -huh. A willingness of the adult to let the child lead and sometimes win. Mm -hmm. There's this reciprocity and this respect, right, for where the child is. Yeah, that, that speaks to the attunement. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> I'm sorry? Physical touch. Physical touch. There's a physical touch often. Different cultures, as you know, 
have different amount of physical touch that seems to be inherent in the way that they show love and receive love, right? What is that comfort level? Yeah. Um, but there's a comfort within that culture of whatever that is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, these, uh, so this uh, repeats what was just said in some ways. The people smile, they often touch each other affectionately, they laugh, they share an interest in something, and the interactions are organized in some constructive way. Uh, like you, we found these kinds of experiences and memories of our nuclear extended families and our friends interacting. So just, this is a very short slideshow, but we wanted you to know that we're real. And um, this is our, uh, some still photos of our, our families, our extended families, and some of our friends and their children, just to, give it, uh, to put this in, in a visual. If I can get it to work. There we go. Muriendo está lentecita el mundo más amor Cuando tenga amor todo cambiará Señor son muchas las montañas Son inmensos los campos y enorme el mar Hay millones de estrellas que brillará más del amor, poco queda ya. Necesita el mundo más amor. Danoslo, Señor, que el amor muriendo está. Necesita el mundo más amor. Cuando tengamos, todo cambiará. Las montañas son inmensos, los campos y enorme el mar. Hay millones de estrellas que brillará más del amor, poco queda ya. Todo cambiará cuando tengamos todo cambiará. It's with my um, niece's son. <laughs> okay. Joy changes the brain in positive ways and counteracts negative emotions. That was from Jack Panksepp, who was mentioned um, last, night. last night, actually. Who was mentioned last night and who passed away just a few weeks ago. Okay. So, how TheraPlay helps children and parents raise self-esteem and expectations with others. I'm reading the slide now and we'll talk a little. First of all, we use a practical and systematic assessment of the parent-child relationship. Through video recording, we show the parents about the child and the dynamics of his or her relationship with others. Now, that's assuming that we can uh, include parents in the treatment. We, as, as you know, we can't always include parents in treatment. But in many settings we can, and in ours we usually can. Mm -hmm. Right. And just to add for what Dave was saying, this assessment 
is a series of eight different activities between the parent and the child, and we get to really see what's happening on videotape of the parent's role and the child's role. Um, and through a series, so we, we get to see if there's a pattern that's happening and how that relates to the presenting concerns, okay? And then another um, area of how TheraPlay helps children and parents um, raise their self-esteem is that, I'm gonna read this part, the therapeutic interventions themselves involve warm physical touch and nonverbal experience the channels, these are the channels that infants and toddlers use to learn about themselves and to develop relationships. Okay. TheraPlay uses touch, multisensory experience, and attuned responsiveness to reach the core self. And as Frazier was talking about, and as many of you have experienced, we need to observe, we need to decide where to, where to intervene. And where we intervene is in joining, is in observing, imitating, joining. So, so um, how fair play helps children and parents raise self-esteem and expectations with others. So the third uh, point is fair play employs activities comfortable to an older child but which speak to younger needs. So the idea is, so this morning you saw um, in that um, video, oh, that's um, Elena? I'm trying to think of the child's name, um, where Sophie was interacting with this little girl and they were imitating each other. It was Elena? I'm not, Elena. Yeah, Elena. Um, so what she was really doing is exactly that babbling back and forth and that imitation is exactly what happens with a baby and a, and a mother in the early stages developmentally. So in TheraPlay, we, we use activities which um, d address those same kinds of dynamics, those same kinds of nonverbal behaviors, but in a way that's comfortable to an older child, so the child does not, does not feel infantilized. Oh, so we're going to show you some examples of um, very short clips of TheraPlay uh, with two school-aged children. Um, so the first one, we're doing a, a game called uh, a child named Philip. Philip and I are doing a game, game called thumb wrestling. Uh, will you raise your hand if you know about thumb wrestling in Spain? <laughs> okay, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Russell is saying it. You, hey, I think the Americans can beat uh, the English anytime, Russell. We'll do it later. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know about that. I've had plenty of people beat me in thumb wrestling. Um, but it's it's a but it becomes a th a therapeutic game when you do it in a certain way. So we'll show you what it looks like. So, um, just to explain a little bit about it. So, we're providing a situation for this boy who's depressed and, um, and also, but also acts out um, in school terribly. Tomorrow we'll talk a little bit more about him if you're in my program. Uh, so, what, what we're providing is a lot of structure for him, an organization to what's going on. And we're also providing a we're touch, so we're in contact with him. We're doing something fun. So it has a lot of elements that this, this boy needs to feel better, but it's also surprising and exciting. So the way that I'm counting, I count in such a way is that he always has to listen, and because when I say to go, it will be under different, different times. I might say one, two, three, go, but I might say, I like you, and you like me, here we go. And so he has to listen, and it's different every time. So that there's a lot of ways to get him engaged with me and, and bring him up. There's a lot more to it, but we'll get to it more. That's enough of that. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to um, I wanted to make a comment that Philip had come in with his posture and his expectation that he would not be able to do anything with Dave, and at the end of that session, he was taller. He told mom. I won the game with him, you know? And he would not have allowed himself or initiated yet, you know, for him to, to invite Dave to interact. 
and many of his difficulties were with his parents. And we'll find out how TheraPlay is a family play therapy. But Dave starts off working with the boy while we were also working with the parents to help them become more knowledgeable and aware of what's going on for their child and then to give them opportunities so we can coach them on how to, you know, how to learn more and not respond from themselves, but to respond in a more empathic way towards the boy. Uh, this is another example with a, a six-year-old girl. Did you notice the eye contact, the physical proximity? There are many points of touch that it is therapist-directed, but that there's a fun interaction that's going on. So this is, this is different. This is different. I think it's important to note, the, the attunement is based on the assessment, what does this child in particular need? So we, we try to focus right in on the issues and the relationships that the child has with other people. So at home, she was having a lot of tantrums and, and issues that had a lot to do with the birth of a younger sibling. So we're giving her a lot of nurture, but she also needed some structure. Okay. So what are we looking at as distinctive characteristics of TheraPlay? We're talking about here and now play. We're not talking about the past. We're not talking about the future. It's here and now. For children who have been traumatized, those children need many, much of the play that you would do, more of the, the child-centered play. And those children also need to have a different narrative, to build that different view of themselves, that coherent narrative about what happened to me over time. And TheraPlay doesn't do that part, but that's, that's a different necessary part that, that happens in other therapies. Also, to have the child um, work through a particular kind of trauma in a more traditional child-centered way is also very, very important. But we also need that child to figure out and to have experiences with healthy touch, healthy relationships. And that's where TheraPlay can help to build that going forward. Okay, So we're talking about here and now play. But the therapist, him or herself, is the primary playroom object because we're dealing with younger, younger level of play. It's a sensory motor attachment base, so it's people. It's people play we're talking about. Secondly, we've got that initial parent-child assessment, which tells us what does the parent like? What does the parent like doing with the child? What is the child receiving? Where are the strengths in that relationship? And where are the difficulties? So we have an idea already of where, we, where to intervene. And at the same time, we are always non-verbally watching and adjusting and saying in a very current here and now way, that felt a little, that felt a little strange to you. Or I think I did that. That didn't feel good when I did that. I'm going to change it up. Let's see. You know, and so that if I am working with a child and it's not on target, right away I am modeling that I am looking and responding to you and that I am able and wanting to change that for you. What you say, what you feel, what you do is important. Okay? So that's what that's my role as, as the therapist as well. And again that parent child assessment helps guide me about what is the prescription and we'll get into that for the child. Um, and the parents' therapy as well, because this morning we talked about we have the parents' psychology, what they bring to the relationship, and we also have the child's as well. Okay. Um, then the third piece is that we prescribe play activities. TheraPlay does this with the therapist and or with the parents, and it's our job to figure out the timing of when the parent can join can join in what way they are, they are watching, 
they are observing, but when are they coming right into the session with us so that they are learning this different way, you know, of dealing with their children, okay? But we're working on the child's emotional level. So the, as you know, the emotional age of the child may be much, much younger than his chronological age, okay? Um, but we're using multi-sensory play, and we're speaking to those younger levels to try and build a more solid base, the internal working model of the child. Okay. Um, uh, I guess you have noticed already that uh, nurturing touch is a big part of uh, physical uh, and active physical engagement to build a deeper relationship that can get at earlier developmental issues in a way that is comfortable to children's actual age. We've mentioned this, I'm not going to belabor it. Um, and we do usually have a lot of fun. It's a very rare therapy session when there aren't some good laughs in it. Um, and parents are involved when possible from the beginning of treatment and often later on. Um, so the relationship qualities that we talked about that are important in the secure relationships um, can be organized in TheraPlay into four different parts. Okay, and I'm going to read these here. What are the qualities of these constructive relationships? And this was Anne Jernberg developed TheraPlay in the 1960s. And in her observing the healthy parent-child interactions, um, she devised four different characteristics that you can, or components, that that constitute TheraPlay, and these also constitute the prescription. So different children are going to need different amounts of structure, engagement, nurture, and challenge. If I have a child who's avoidant and, or, and a child who's aggressive and pushes everybody away, at first, he needs to feel safe. At first, he needs to have some sense of predictability and consistency, okay? And then, so that, that's really structure, and we'll go into that fairly quickly. And we'll explain that. And then he needs something else. He needs to be filled up. He needs to have these opportunities that he has missed out on, okay? So that's an example. Yeah. Um, as, um, Dr. Maroney mentioned this morning that these are man-made categories, um, but they are very helpful in guiding your treatment. They do blend together sometimes, but they, they, thinking about clients' needs in these ways can be helpful. Uh, even for my adult clients, I sometimes think, what does this person really need? So if I have a hysterical personality adult, I might be thinking the person needs some structure for me to organize a little bit, so she starts to inter or he starts to internalize a little more. So structure is um, the parent builds a holding environment, defining physical boundaries, helping the child learn about himself or herself, and setting limits. This takes different forms at different developmental stages. So structure for a, a little baby uh, some is setting up routines of when the child's going to be fed, when the child's going to be sleeping, and all the simple, the diaper changing routines that happen. There's a kind of structure. And then soon there's this stuff about, okay, those are, this is my nose, and that's your nose, a little baby, and this is, it start to differentiate that child from the uh, carer. And for a, a school-aged kid, uh, structure takes the form of helping the child be organized, getting to places on time, getting homework done. Um, maybe they don't have homework everywhere, but in America they have way too much of it. Um, but uh, organizing the day and organizing relationships, like, uh, the child had a fight with a little girl or boy in school, and uh, how can you know, doing some problem solving around how to do that? For a teenager, if if the things have gone really well, structure might be um, totally internalized. All right. And then about engagement, the parent connects emotionally with the child, and this is that um, accurate affective attunement. It leads to immediacy here and now and a sense of intimacy. Um, there's usually eye contact involved and a sense of shared experience. Um, sometimes you also see a sense of, of surprise and joy, and that's part of engagement as well. 
Uh, the nurture part seems intuitive for most of us. So the parent protects, comforts, and feeds the child. Warm physical touch supports the process of becoming self-regulating. So uh, kissing boo-boos uh, or bandaging a, a scrape that the child had on the playground uh, helping the child talk through something that happened in a way that the child feels comforted and, and more relaxed. All those um, are nurture experiences. The other component about nurture is that it's not earned. It's that you are valuable for who you are here and now with everything you bring and whoever you are. Not for what you can perform or do for me. That kind of thing. And then looking at challenge. That's the other component. That helps with the motivation. St think of it as stretching. Think of it like a rubber band, but not so that the child breaks. So we need to have an accurate idea about where the child is developmentally. We can't, and many parents that I see have unrealistic ideas about what a child should or can do, and they need to have that, um, have that a little more realistic so that they, in fact, can then be successful with their child. So we're going to um, show you a video of a parent-child activity. Um, this is um, that same boy you saw before, later in treatment, when his mom came into the room. So in the very beginning, I'm coaching the mom on how to um, work this game. Now at this point in this TheraPlay protocol, what's happened is the child, the parents have been observing a video of the play sessions that we've had with the child. So in, at that part of treatment, the child comes in for about 25 minutes, and I play with the child, or Sue does. Then we make a video of the session, and then the parents come in for the rest of the time, and then we look at the video, talk about what's going on, what the child needs, and relate it to what's going on at home. So it's an effort to integrate all that. Okay, so TheraPlay, you know, it's trying to get across TheraPlay in, in an hour and ten minutes or something is a bit difficult. Usually it takes a, a four-day workshop to really get it. But we, we did our best trying to figure out how we can show this to you. It comes in different forms. So you saw individual TheraPlay, a little bit of it today. Now a little bit of what family TheraPlay looks like. And there's also group TheraPlay, and there's a form of that that's used in school classrooms called Sunshine Circles. And the idea of this is to promote um, pro-social behavior among children in a classroom. And it's quite, uh, it's quite exciting to see this happen. Sue does group TheraPlay with children on the autism spectrum disorder. And it's quite exciting to see how much it can help with the socialization of those kids. There is also there are TheraPlay being used for senior citizens. So you can ask me about it later. <clears throat> so TheraPlay, uh, you want to do this? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm to it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, TheraPlay can be used for children who present many kinds of concerns. So it can be used with anxiety, with depression, social phobia, overactivity. I don't like the term attention deficit disorder hyperactivity. I like overactivity because most boys and girls are just active and teachers think they're overactive because they don't sit in their seats. Um, low self-esteem and self-confidence, reactive attachment disorder are... You know, we call it, I think we more inclined to call it um, uh, trauma issues. But um, tra TheraPlay needs to be combined with other approaches there with a much more uh, extensive kind of way of dealing with the kids. But it can be part of the program for kids with trauma. It can help with the attachment. It can help with the uh, nurture and lots of ways to build relationships, say, with foster or adoptive parents. It can be used with oppositional defiant disorder, which is always a party. Um, and it can be used with obsessive compulsive disorder, developmental disorders, and with autism spectrum disorder kids. And we've, and we've used it with just so many other things, including kids who are selectively mute. Does anybody here work with selectively mute kids? Kids who do not talk? Mm -hmm. So it can be used for lots of things. Um, I, we have want to show you a little video now of Sue working with a child used on the autism spectrum disorder. Mm -hmm. This was a child I had worked with on a regular basis and was coming, he was coming again for a checkup for a while. And he was more distant when he came in. And he would frequently make little sounds and kind of music phrases. And he would use that both to comfort himself, 
but also to keep others away. It seemed like there were two different purposes for that. And so he was doing this song, like that, okay? And with children with autism, or those who are more withdrawn, engagement, as you might know, or we know, um, engagement is, is the, key, the key component. We can't, can't work with really this child if he's not, if, if I can't engage with him or he can't engage with me in some way. So watch how I use his do 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 as part of my ready, set, go. And when Dave talked about meeting younger needs, but by dressing up the activity in something a little more challenging, I'm doing a cotton ball blow. I am, we are blowing the cotton ball. It's cotton ball hockey. Think of it that way, back and forth. So you'll see this. Okay. The touch helps him keep regulated with me. We have our boundaries, so important for a child. We're easy to leave. <laughs> so um, even children with relatively secure attachments can benefit from experiences that relate to their early years. Um, so some of the less uh, troubled kids, can, you can use therapy in lots of ways. You can use it as a way to quickly build a close relationship. And then in, you can do that, and you can move into some more projective play techniques. You can even do a sand tray in the middle if, if, you, if the sand tray people don't kill me for saying that. And then you can do the, the, um, the therapy as a way to connect with the child and then for the child to do some more projective techniques and then end with a nurturing activity, say. So there's lots of ways that you can use it. I'm going to show you an example with a, um, a teenage boy who in this uh, video is 13. I first saw him when he was 10. Uh, his parents were divorcing, and it was around some of those issues. He was a boy um, who just loved sports and also hated school. And wasn't school smart, but was generally average intelligence. But uh, he was going to have some difficulties with school. So I'm just going to show you a little bit of how we reconnected uh, when I first saw him this time. So we did what's called a check-in. And we, we do this in some form at the beginning of most individual therapy sessions. A check-in is a way to recognize a child for all his or her neat qualities, uh, the, the special things about the child, and notice exactly things that are going on right now. It could even be talking about a t-shirt the child's wearing, or the glasses, or other facial features. So what I did with this boy, because he's so athletic, is I, we worked on some of his positive attributes so that he could feel better about the, the struggles he was having in other um, areas. So you could, you could see all of the number of things that Dave did. You know, where are you now? Are you the same boy as I met you back then? Wow, look at how you're unique and you're different and you're cool and look what you have here. All right, so looking at it, we want, what are the outcomes? We want to move the child's internal working model, his view of himself in the world, right? We want to move that towards positive. Um, we want to help that child have more positive self-regulation, and we know that touch helps that, and the sense of structure and boundaries help that piece. Um, positive change in the parent's view of him or herself. That's really important because they are going home. You know, we are going to work with the parent, but they, they live that, their relationships together. So we want the parent to feel positive as well. Um, we want the relationship and behavior problems to drop out. And we find that once we help the child feel better about themselves, that frequently many of the presenting concerns do drop out, okay, for this population anyway. And then um, we want to look at what are the benefits that you see in secure attachments. Can we see that in TheraPlay? Also, better social skills, um, better school performance, because the child is more freed up. He doesn't have the thoughts that are intruding. He's feeling better about himself. He's more able to focus um, and pay attention. A sense of more competence. And then, hopefully, a trajectory that leads towards more positive mental health. Okay, so uh, just so you know, there's a fair amount of scientific evidence now supporting the effectiveness of therapy, and um, uh, 
please write that down as quickly as you can, because I'm going on. Um, no, let us know. We'd be glad to give you those references. It's really, uh, it's really sure. nice to see it happen. Um, just so you know, TheraPlay is a registered uh, approach. Um, the reason for this is to make sure that practitioners maintain a high level of consistent competence. Uh, special parts of TheraPlay, especially using physical contact, require a high le level of training. Um, to become certified, um, you need to go through the Therapy Institute. We'll talk about this another time. But it's, um, the effort is to make sure that people are using it in a way that's safe for the therapist and safe for the child. Um, so, in sum, decades of research show that about two-thirds of people are securely attached to other people. Um, even good enough parenting can be challenged by war, illness, profound poverty, and so forth. So as therapists, how can we reach more people effectively and quickly? Uh, TheraPlay offers an approach that attempts to address this challenge, and the therapists and families have fun doing it. Mm -hmm. you want to add? That's really it. I think that's about it. Yeah. So let us know if you want to talk more about it. We appreciate you hearing about this, this different way of addressing children and families, and thank you so much. Yeah.